Hello everyone, Pastor Jordan here again today. I hope you are doing well. I um, hope that uh, everything is, is good, uh, that, that you're staying healthy. Um, if there's anything you need, uh, please reach out to me. I'd be glad to help any way I can. Uh, remember, send in your tithe, P.O. Box 475, York, South Carolina, 29745. Uh, but before we uh, jump into this next lesson in Exodus, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And Lord, we thank you for this time we can come and to open up your word together. Lord, I pray now that you would bless each one of those that are listening. Lord, draw each one of us closer to you. And Lord, I pray that we would see you in all your glory and all your honor uh, for all that you have done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we pick up... Uh, uh, our story where we left off last week, uh, Moses has just gone before Pharaoh uh, in the ninth plague, and Pharaoh has refused to let the people go and has responded in anger. And so now in chapter 11, we pick up right where we left off. Uh, we're probably still in the throne room here, and uh, in beginning chapter 11, we see Moses gets uh, a message from God, uh, probably right there in the throne room. Um, and God tells him that there is going to be one more plague that he is going to bring. And after that, Pharaoh is finally going to let the people go. And this plague is going to be so bad that he is going to drive them out. Man, woman, child, livestock, all of them. And so he tells Moses to go ahead and have the people start asking uh, the neighbors for jewelry. Uh, and we'll see what the implication that has uh, later on. But we're told here that the Lord... Um, has, has already shown that there's kind of been a reversal um, taking place. You look in, at verse 3, that uh, the people actually have favor now in the sight of the Egyptians. Remember, these were people that were oppressed, that were slaves, but now they've seen quite clearly who the God of the Israelites are, and so they're, you know, they've gained a, a lot of respect. Uh, and also Moses himself, um, he's told to be great in the land, uh, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. But you notice the one person that's missing here is Pharaoh. The one person uh, that has yet to learn the lesson. And so God uh, tells Moses what he's going to do. And Moses ends up saying this. Uh, that you know, at midnight, um, God is going to go out um, into the midst of Egypt. And he is going to kill every firstborn in the land. Um, from the firstborn of Pharaoh all the way down to the firstborn of the... Um, the lowest of the low, the slave girl uh, in the Egyptian land, even the beasts, as he says, the firstborn of the cattle. And he says there's going to be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt that's never been heard before. There's going to be such devastation. But we're also told here that not a dog shall growl against any people of Israel, either man or beast. And quite this is what's saying is there's not going to be no hostility at all um, towards the people of God. Um, the people in Goshen are going to be safe. Uh, quite clearly God showing a division between the people uh, of Israel and Egypt. And in this, all the servants are gonna, of Egypt are going to bow down to him saying, uh, get out, uh, send all your people out. Not, not that they would truly believe, but you know, to get out so that the calamity uh, would stop. And it's interesting here, you know, Pharaoh has said, no, 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 no. Um, but now we see God himself, uh, if Pharaoh's not going to let the people out of Egypt, then God is going to come in. And so what he does here is, uh, then he instructs them on what they are to do, um, afterwards as far as Passover goes. And, um, we've heard of this before. And so beginning in chapter 12, God starts giving instructions. He says, this is going to be the first, uh, at the beginning of the month for you. Uh, this is going to be the first month of the year. Uh, he says to tell the, the, the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of the month um, that every man uh, is going to take a lamb and according to each house, according to each household. And if, uh, if your house was too small for a lamb, then um, you can go to your nearest neighbor uh, and be counted among them. Um, and so they would all gather to eat the lamb. Now this lamb uh, was to be one without blemish. Uh, it was to be a male around a year old. And it could either be a sheep uh, or a goat. And then, uh, I mean, this has to be a, without blemish, it's actually going to, you know, kind of go 
foreshadowing the, the sacrifices later on um, in Christ himself. And so they can uh, they would keep this this lamb or this goat for four days, and then after that um, they would kill the lamb at twilight. All of Israel would do that. And then what they would do is they would take the blood and they were told to put it on the two doorposts and lintel at the top of each of their houses. Um, and we're told that this blood is going to be a sign uh, for them that uh, they are numbered among God's people. And it's interesting here is you know, why, why do this with blood? Well, you know, the blood is the essence of, of life, and this was to show the, the extremity of the, the covenant that they had with God. And that covenant included life and death. And we actually see this foreshadowed with Christ, uh, which uh, we see quite clearly in the New Testament with the New Covenant um, and how he has shed his blood for us. But they're told that they are to, to put this, this blood on the doorposts, on the lintel, and they are to, to eat the lamb. Um, they're told that they're going to they're, they're roast it on the fire like they would kind of on a spit, and then they're, they're going to eat the lamb. Um, it says, don't eat it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts, all of it, so that nothing remains in the morning, nothing left. They're also been told to eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs uh, from that night. And they are told that uh, they are to have their sandals on their feet, uh, their belt fastened, and their staff in their hand, and they are to eat quickly, for this is the Lord's Passover. Uh, quite clearly, we see that uh, they are to be ready to go. There's going to be no, no food left to have to pack up. Their shoes are on their feet. Uh, their clothes are ready. Their, st their walking staff is in hand. Everything is ready to go because when God is going to come, he's going to come swiftly, and they need to be ready to, to move out. And uh, we're, we're told here that you know God, he is going to pass through the land again, and he's going to strike the firstborn in the land of man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt he will execute judgments, for I am the Lord, as he says. Remember, from the beginning of this, God has been trying to show that he is indeed greater than all the gods of Egypt, including Pharaoh. And uh, he is about to show it all right here uh, in this final plague. And so what he does is he also gives instructions on how uh, Israel is to, to keep this, this feast in the future. It's going to be a memorial day um, to remind all the people in future generations um, of what God has done here in Egypt. And during this, uh, this feast, they are told that they are, you know, seven days they're going to eat unleavened bread. Now, leaven, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, was, was used to make the bread rise. And so uh, if there was any kind of leaven at all, that bread would rise. But remember, in the Exodus, Israel didn't have time for the bread to rise. So it was unleavened bread. We actually see that in how we use it in the communion. Um, and as they commemorate this, they are told that on the first day they're going to remove all the leaven out of their house so that no, none of the bread uh, will get leaven in it and, and rise. And this is something that God is taking very seriously here. Uh, he says, if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person is to be cut off from Israel. Um, it's a big deal. And they're told on the first day they're going to hold a holy assembly. And the seventh day, hold the holy assembly. No work shall be done on these days, like the Sabbath, like our Sundays we're supposed to do. Uh, and they were told that they are to, to observe this feast of unleavened bread to remind them of the day that he brought uh, his people out of the land of Egypt. And they're to do this um, in the first month from the 14th day um, until the 21st day. And as he repeats about the leaven to, to show that, you know, he's, he's serious about this. Anybody that's in the land, whether it's a, an Israelite or, or, somebody, or a sojourner or whoever it might be, they're called to, to follow uh, these instructions from the Lord. And so after this, then God, or excuse me, then Moses calls the elders. He gives them all the instructions. Uh, they are to take a bunch of hyssop, uh, which is a plant used to, to put it around the doorposts. And they are to follow these instructions. They are to stay inside uh, don't go outside uh, until morning. He also instructs them that in the future they are to observe uh, this as well. And that that and the reason for this is, especially in verse 26, when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, 
is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians that spared our houses. By this, by how they worship, they will show their children why it is they do what they do. And then we're told, starting in verse 29, that the Lord uh, went through the land and he struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Uh, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, as he has said, all the way down to the firstborn of the captives and the firstborn of the livestock. And we're told this, this destroyer had come through. This was not some malevolent uh, demonic force, but uh, the, an angel of the Lord that has done this. And we're told that Pharaoh rose up in the night. Um, he, all his servants, all the Egyptians, this had happened. And as God had said, there was a great cry in Egypt uh, that had never been heard before. There was not a house where someone was not dead. Um, and the Egyptians had the option to do this as well. They put the blood on the doorpost and the Lord would pass over. But those that did not, we see now the Lord is you know, making true of what he had said. And so because of that, Pharaoh finally breaks and he summons Moses and Aaron. He says, up, go out from among the people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. Remember, before he tried to sit, well, you can just send the men, or you can just send everything but the flocks. But now he says, all of you, just get out. And the end, he says, and bless me also. Uh, for him to ask to be blessed, remember, this was a man that thought he was a god. Uh, we see him finally submitting and realizing that he is no match for uh, God himself. And Moses, as his servant, he is saying, bless him. He's acknowledging that he is submitting here. And finally we see he has let the people go. Well, when it comes to application, there is a ton that we could say here. Um, I think at the very beginning of this, as I kind of mentioned, uh, we, we see a, a glimpse of the gospel. Uh, as I said, you know, Pharaoh refused to let the people go, so what did God do? Well, he came into Egypt. And we can quite clearly see what uh, he has done in Jesus Christ. Um, you know, obviously the devil is not going to let us go out of our sin. And so uh, what, what God does is he, come, he makes a way to do it by himself coming into this world in order to save his people, in order to, uh, to deliver his people out of the bondage, not of Egypt, but from our sin and from the devil. And so we, we see that here. Uh, also from this, as we, we see you know, quite clearly there is impending doom coming. As um, Moses warns about this final plague, uh, but Pharaoh refuses to listen, and uh, because of that, he pays the price. And again, uh, when we're presented with God, we're presented with the gospel. We see that we are sinners, and we there is a need to repent. Uh, and there's, there's many in this world uh, that refuse to repent, and sadly. Uh, there will come a day when that judgment will come. Just as God brought about this plague, there will be a day when we all stand before his throne and those that have repented and turned to Christ uh, will be saved. Uh, they will be spared. And uh, those that did not, uh, they are going to face the consequences of it. But again, it just reminds, we see this uh, theme throughout Scripture uh, in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Uh Another thing that I think you know, comes out here is uh, you know, God's uh, zeal for his own worship. Um, God takes the way that he calls us to worship seriously. As he is lining out um, how the Passover is to be celebrated, he is very clear um, on what they are to be doing. Um, and Israel is supposed to follow his instructions. If they don't, there are going to be consequences. Uh, and I think this translates to today, uh, we think we can worship uh, however we want. Now, there is definitely some freedom uh, in what we can do, but there are things that we can't do um, in worship. And I'm not going to go through the list of uh, what is and what is not here. Um, but the big thing that we need to do is to see, is our worship biblical? Is it what God has, has set forth for us? Um, I know last year, if you were able to listen... Um, and I would highly recommend, if, if you haven't, there are some sermons on this. Um, we actually walked through uh, our different parts of worship and kind of showed where Scripture shows those to come from. Uh, anything that is not what God ha has said we should do, we shouldn't do. Because God takes His worship seriously. And what better way to know what is good and right and to do than to follow what He has already said in His Word. 
Now, uh, one of the biggest things that I really want all of us to see here uh, as we see this first Passover happening um, is this lamb that is being sacrificed. By this lamb's sacrifice and its blood on their own doorposts, uh, the people escape judgment. And we quite clearly see this in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the true Passover lamb, as we see, especially in the New Testament, uh, that focuses upon this point that, you know, Christ, he is the perfect sacrifice. He is our Passover lamb who was slain, uh, that by his blood uh, we would escape judgment for our sin. And you know, as we, we look at this Passover and see how you know, God delivered the people uh, from Egypt because of this, we look at Christ and see by what he has done, by his sacrifices. You know, the Bible calls him you know, the Lamb of God. I mean, he, he is the, the Lamb, the one that has laid down his life, that was slain um, so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be saved. And uh, we quite clearly see deliverance with Christ and not only you know, delivering a people out of a land, but delivering us from sin, from the devil. Uh, and so we can rejoice uh, whenever we think about uh, the Passover and we can see Christ quite clearly here, all the way in the Old Testament. And I think from this, uh, that, that informs us about why we do the Lord's Supper. Um, as Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper there um, during Passover uh, on the night that he was betrayed, uh, he quite clearly shows you know, the sacrifice by the bread, by the cup, that you know, as his body is broken. It's his blood that's been poured out uh, for us. And uh, we quite clearly see the, the Exodus motif uh, here when Jesus is, is doing this. And this kind of points us to the Lord's Supper, which has taken the place of Passover for us. And it shows us why we do it, just as you know, God had them... Uh, institute this meal for future generations so they would understand exactly what had happened so as they partake in this their parents can and their grandparents can explain to them uh, how God had delivered them from Egypt uh, we take the Lord's Supper uh, to remind us what Christ has done for us now in in that meal we are you know Christ nourishes us spiritually uh, but why we do the Lord's Supper is well one because Jesus commanded it but also it points us back uh, to what he has done for us. And so that our children and those that would come after us, uh, continue to come after us as the church, would understand what Christ has done, and that's why and that and why we has why we do it. And I think there's an important uh, point for us here, not just with uh, the Lord's Supper, but in all that we do, as God kind of lined out with worship, in this, we have to to understand why we do what we do. Uh, as the church, well, why we do what we do in worship? You know, we could say easily that, well, we grew up doing this, but uh, there are many things that many churches do that uh, aren't quite biblically correct. I'll leave it at that. Um, but we do it for the sake of tradition. But we need to understand, as the church, uh, why we are worshiping the way we are, why we are we are coming, why we are praying, why does our order of worship look like it does? Um, why do we worship in general? Um, and understanding all these reasons, then we can convey these things to our children. Just as we see here done in the Passover, um, explaining to our children, when they ask, you know, why do we do this? Well, you can walk them through step by step exactly why it is. Just as I had mentioned with why we do the Lord's Supper, we can explain that to our children. But first, we need to understand why we are doing what we are doing. And so I'd encourage you uh, to... To not just go through the motions, but to understand, you know, why we do all that we do as the church, why we do all we do as Christians. Uh, so that way we are growing, but also we can pass that same knowledge and down to those after us uh, that God would use that to help them grow as well. And so there's so much more than I can say here, but uh, I think that that is good here for one lesson for all of us. Well, as we close out the video, let's pray again together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for what it teaches about who you are. Lord, we look in what you have done in the Exodus, you've done in the Passover, and Lord, we cannot uh, be more thankful. Uh, for we look to you, we look to Christ, who is indeed our Passover lamb uh, slain, so that we uh, would be safe, that we would not be judged. 
And Lord, I pray that you would just continue to help us each and every day to follow you, to worship you according to your word, Lord, and to uh, show forth your glory in our lives. I pray all this in Jesus' name.